And hello, this is the Tinker and Create class on, uh, I was about to say digital game design. That's our other class. This is the Tinker and Create class on animation and 3D modeling. My name is Doug Teppi. I'm the lead instructor for Tinker and Create. And tonight we are going to finally get around to what the whole class is about. We're going to be animating. So last week we had just uh, finished putting together our person and, uh, adding in armatures and bones so that way we can actually pose and model our person. So uh, that's where we're going to start off. We're going to uh, see if we can finish filling in the class. We're going to finish uh, filling in the room and positioning everything. And then we're going to put our person at one end of the room and animate them to the other side of the room. So let's go. I'm just going to make sure here that my live Information is all set and the stream is working good. Great. All right, so let's go and bring up Blender. And so looking here at Blender at the startup screen, I'm going to go to my live animation class here. And there is our person and our table and chairs and everything. And zooming in on the person here, we see we had painted on a nice little smiling face here, as well as our bones here in our armature. Now, one thing I noticed that I forgot to do, actually, is that looking at the leg here, while I'm in pose mode, let me get my face over to the other side here, while I'm in pose mode, um, the legs here don't actually quite work right. So just making sure that you're actually in pose mode over here on the left hand side. Look down at the legs and I'm going to switch off the material preview and just go back to the solid view. So looking at the solid view here, if I grab one of these legs right along the at the knee joint here, and I rotate it along, you're going to see that the mesh underneath it is still straight. It's not actually bending the knee. And uh, the reason why is because I actually forgot to put in an extra seam along the middle there. So that would be a um, another edge cut right through the middle. So don't worry, not all is lost. If you need to make further changes to your mesh after you've already brought it together with your uh, armature, we can actually just go over here onto the right-hand side. Let me get my face out of the way. So right over here on the right-hand side, you're gonna see the armature and then the person mesh is listed underneath that. Drop open the person mesh and you'll see the cube two is listed there. Once you actually click on that, then you're gonna see that we go back into edit mode here. So with edit mode, then the arms go back straight out and we can see all the lines and the faces of our person. So to add in an additional um, set of uh, edges here, we can do that by pressing Control R. Let me see if my screencast keys is working again here. So clicking Control R, will give us the loop cut. And the loop cut will basically just go perpendicular to the lines that I'm dragging it next to. So for example, if I put it along the middle of the lines here, you'll see that the loop cut goes through the middle over there. So as you can see that it's showing me where the loop cut is going to go through the legs here. So I click to place it on one leg, and then it's gonna to want to know where I want to place the loop cut but I just want to drop it right down in the middle so I use the right click. So that just leaves it right back at the center again. And I don't need to include any additional cuts or anything as we see over here on the side. It's perfect just the way it is. So I'm just going to do another loop cut on the other side here. And it does give a warning saying that because the mesh has been deformed by the armature, it might have problems, but that's okay. Probably would have been better for us to actually make sure that we did this right from the beginning, but this will still give us the actual effect that we're looking for. 
So now I've got two cuts right in the middle, right where the knees should be. Actually, come to think of it, I should have placed them actually a little bit more towards the knee. So actually, let's do Control Z to undo and try the loop cut again. This time, I'm going to use the orthographic node by clicking numpad one. A reminder, of course, you can quickly switch between all the different orthographic views by clicking on the little wheel in the upper right hand corner of the viewport here. Has the same effect. So numpad one, this gives me the front orthographic view. And then I will press control R to place in my loop cut. Click it down. This time, I'm going to bring it up right to the base of the knee. And I'm going to look right up to the top left-hand corner of the viewport. And you're going to see there's the edge slide, and it's showing a point number. So 0 means it's right in the center, and then point 1 means it's slightly above. I actually want to make sure that I keep the same number on both legs. So that way the knee is actually bending at the same place. So let's say 0 0.15, 0 0.15. That's pretty good. Okay, now it's locked in place. I'm gonna do another loop cut on the other side. Left click to drop it down and then type in 0.15 again. There we go. Now the seams are right along where the joints are. And so when I go back to the armature and switch it into pose mode, Oh wait, here we are. Let me go back into object mode first. There we go. Going back into object mode, you can see that now the knees are getting properly bent. So I can switch it into pose mode, drop down the menu here, switch it into pose mode. And when I rotate the knee, you'll see that it actually deforms properly right along the seam that I just added. Which is good. That's what I wanted. Of course, we don't want to flip it upside down. That just plain looks weird. So <laughs> instead, we will just put it there. Okay, and then, um, let's see here. Good enough, I think, for now. So, let's take a look at the rest of our scene. Now we want to actually start posing everything. So, we can actually have a room here with a, a wall and a window, maybe even a doorway and the like. So, best bet would be to switch it into object mode making sure that we are using the layout or the modeling um, settings, the workshop, setting, workshop settings right up here. Um, and I've got the camera right here. So the main thing is I want to make sure that the whole scene is in front of the camera. So for now, I'm actually just going to grab everything. Except for the camera. And it grabbed the light too. I don't really want it to grab the light. That's yeah, because the light's actually over there. I just want to get all this stuff out of the way. That's the main reason I'm doing this. So I'm just going to grab it, move it over here, grab the person, move it over there. Okay, so now it's out of the way. We've got our light source over there. The camera is currently looking in this direction. I can press the numpad zero to see what the camera sees. We'll probably end up wanting to adjust the camera as well. So I'm clicking and holding down the middle mouse button to just take a look around here. So what I want to do then is I'm going to add it in the floor. So let's take the cursor here. Click right over into a central place right there. The cursor is going to be where we place our floor, and then we're going to add in a mesh as a plane. Now, right now, the plane is two meters wide. Its location is negative 1.8 meters below. I want it to actually be up at floor level. There we go. I'll leave in the X and the Y just the way they are. Oh, no. Okay, so now we want to look straight down on the top of it. Grab it. Oh, I didn't grab it. Here we are. Click on it and grab it. There we go. So I'm going to place it more towards the center where the camera was pointing. Scale it out till it's a bit wider now. Now we got a pretty decent floor with the camera looking out over it. 
move it a little bit to the side on the x-axis. Now just be careful, of course, as you move it around in the perspective view here, it could of course go up and down on the z-axis. I still want to keep it along the zero axis just so everything is nice and centered here. So I'm just going to click X after I start moving it so that way it's not going to go up and down on the z-axis. I'm going to move it kind of more into the middle here, scale it again, but this time along the x-axis so it's wider. Grab it one more time, move it along the y-axis so it's further along. Let's see what the camera sees. I'm gonna actually just move the camera up. Z axis, move the camera up. Let's take a look again at what the camera sees. Uh, one trick, of course, for moving the camera around too is that you can press N to bring up the details menu here. And in the view menu over on this side, there is an option to lock camera to view. Meaning that as I look around now, I'm actually moving the camera with me. So this way I can actually position the camera so that way it can actually get a good view of the entire room here. Don't really need to see all the corners, I just want to get two corners. Probably good enough for now, we're probably going to move it again later. I'm going to turn off the lock camera to view. All right, so now we've got this um, floor here. So let's switch into edit mode. Now that we're in edit mode, we want to use the edge select. So we can just select the outer edges of this. We want to keep the um, we want to keep the room open so that way the camera can look into the room. So of course we're making this like a lot of how uh, of how a lot of TV shows are often recorded, so that it might look like a room, but it's actually completely open, so that way the directors and the actors can all stand behind the camera and watch what's going on in the room. So we're doing the same thing here. So I'm just gonna pick the back edge, press shift click and click the other back edge, E to extrude it, Z to lock it in, and I'm gonna pull it up. So we got some nice walls going on here. Is it high enough? I didn't pay attention to how high I made it. I made it five meters tall. Probably too tall. So I'm gonna grab it and bring it back down a shade. Down maybe two meters or so. This room maybe is actually getting too big. I don't know. I'm just making it as I go along. It looks cool for the time being. All right, so we got these lines here. And what we're going to want to do now is click on the faces. We switched into face select mode. Again, we can actually switch those modes by pressing the 1, 2, and 3 buttons along the top of the keyboard. In other words, the numbers above the letters, not your number pad. So by pressing 1, 2, and 3, I can switch between the line select mode and the face select mode. Then I pick both of these faces and extrude it again. This time I want to extrude them just out a shade. Let's look straight down on it here. Oops. Press seven to lock it into the top view mode, zoom down. And as I extrude it, that's actually fine. A little bit diagonal on the sides, but I'm just trying to give it enough thickness so if I cut a hole in it, we'll actually have a nice window going on here. Now, uh, you know what? Looks like I extruded it backwards. Okay, so that actually is not going to work. Maybe it's better if I just extrude them one by one. Extrude. There we go. Extrude. That's what I want. Oh, they're still backwards. Hmm. Huh. Oh, you know what? It's because all my normals are switched. So to switch the normals again, normals basically just indicates um, which side a face is facing. So for example, like this, if I extrude this out, it's actually going to make it hollow in the inside because it considers the object to be facing on the outside over here. Likewise, if I push it this way, it will actually be solid on the other way.
Let's actually do it in both ways. Okay, I guess I'm just forgetting how Blender actually works about this. So it varies from different 3D modeling programs. So I guess I'm just gonna have to do it differently here. All right, so I extrude this around. I click on this edge while pressing Alt. And I make a face. And actually cut the face in half. This still isn't necessarily what I want it to be doing. Hmm, hmm, hmm. All right, you know what I'm going to do first then? I'm actually just going to make the... Make the window first, actually. And then I'll worry about making it thick enough later. That's how I did it the last time, so I'm going to stick to that way again this time. All right, great. So, I did this. Let me just demonstrate quickly. I did this by creating an inset which just creates another plane on the inside here. And then I'm gonna scale this down along the Y axis. No, that's the X axis, there we are. And then lock it into the X axis again, so it's positioned over here. And this can be our window. Now I can extrude the window backwards. There you go. You can see actually how this is making it as a hole on the other side. That's fine, because I'm actually just gonna be cutting this completely open. So now I'm gonna remove this face right here. That's what I wanted to see. All right. So now with this properly like this, we've got a nice little window. And you can't even tell, of course, that it's a hollow wall on the backside because we're not even ever going to go onto the backside anyways. Our guy is just going to be walking in front of it the whole time. And likewise, too, I can still press the Alt button and click on this. Select the loop cut. There we go. So making sure, of course, when you want to select the loop cut, you don't click on the lines along the side here. You click it along the lines that are perpendicular to the loop cut you're trying to select. So because I've got this whole loop right around here, then if for some reason I change my mind at a later point and I still want to resize it, I can still resize this at a later point while still maintaining my window. Great, now let's go over to this wall here, do the same thing, but this time we want to create a doorway. Another way of Cutting things is instead of, here we are, I want to press three, there we are. So instead of going off and using, for example, an inset to make one, sometimes you can also use the uh, knife cut tool, which I believe is right over here, this button right on the side, or you can press the K. So the knife cut tool, what can be done then is, is that it can actually just cut what is a straight line or any line in any direction you want. Of course, I want to lock this along the Z axis. That doesn't work the way I thought it did. I've cut, of course, is going to be a little bit zigzaggy. But once I right click on this, no, let's try this again. Knife cut. It up once, twice, three times, back to origin. Still not actually cutting properly. One, two, three. Enter key. Yes, it was the enter key that does it. There we go. And I've managed to cut my door into the wall here. So there we go. Now with this door here, I can go back to my select mode, click on the door, extrude it backwards a little bit. And in this case, we don't actually want it to be removed. We're actually just gonna add a texture for this later as our door, maybe wood or something like that. 
But being slightly inset is kind of like how doors often actually work. There's the threshold on the door, and then the door actually opens through the threshold. So we've got a window and a door. Now let's take our objects over here. Oops, switch back to object mode. Grab our objects over here. Oops. Bring the Bring the picture over here. So grab it, drag it along the y-axis, pull it in close. Switch it over to there, press three for right orthographic and seven for left orthographic. I mean three and nine. Can barely see everything because I'm looking at it straight on the side. That's an interesting effect, but I can still see roughly where the edge is, so I'm just going to push this right up to the edge here. And it doesn't have to be completely pushed up against it, but close enough. Grab it again, looking at it from the front orthographic, so it's more of a portrait that hangs along in the middle of the wall. There we go. Now we'll grab our table and bring that up over here too. We'll zoom on on this with the number pad period button. And then the same thing as before, just push it down till it's just touching the floor. Doesn't really matter if it's slightly pushed through the floor or if it's actually hovering above. The camera is not really going to notice that distinction. Actually, of course, the location is set right over here in the details menu over here on the side. One way I could cheat this is to make sure that it's actually at zero at all times. Oh, no, wait, that's the 3D cursor. Yeah, let's click on the item. There we go. So it's the item that I wanted to change. So, for example, I can actually change the height to zero. And it's going to actually place it right in the center of where the table is. So, you know what? That's not going to work either. Oh, it was my table anyways. The table is 1.08 meters. So I'll just make this 1.08. Now it's truly precise, which was never really necessary all along anyways. But sometimes I just can't leave well enough alone. All right. So 1.08, and I can get this further up here. If I bring the cursor over here. Oops, there we go. All right. So same thing with this, the actual origin point for this particular object is actually kind of hovering in the air. So when I switch into object mode here, it's the same thing as before. If I change this to say zero, no, not that's the dimensions, here we are. If I change its location to zero, it's actually gonna be below the floor because the floor currently is at zero. So let me just quickly show you, if you ever wanted to actually change the origin, this is how I usually go about doing it. So let's just move this up in the air a little bit. And I'm going to click the face along the bottom here. Then I press Shift S to change where the cursor is going to. I'm going to say bring the cursor to the selected. 
Now with the cursor on the selected, I can switch back into object mode and under the object menu, there is an option to set the origin to the 3D cursor. Now the cursor, now the origin of my object is right on top of the 3D cursor, which happens to be right in the middle of that face that I selected. So now the advantage of that is, is that when I set the dimensions to 1.0, no, not the dimensions, sorry, the location to 1.08, it's going to bring it right into, well, the center of my table, because I forgot the center of the table was actually the origin of the table. So still not quite accurate, but at least it still gives me a better idea of where my object is going to be placed. So sometimes you might need to change the origin. Um, for those of you who have also had the problem in the past where um, we discussed in the previous week, if you accidentally added in an additional mesh to your object and now you're noticing that your object is traveling around with that mesh, the same thing can sometimes happen too where your origin gets really badly misplaced. So let's say I take this vase here while I'm in edit mode and I press G to grab it and I drag it all around. So now my origin still is back on the table, but the object has been drawn far away from the origin. That means that now if I rotate it, it's actually gonna be rotating around the origin. So of course, this could create some frustration if you're like, no, I just want to rotate the vase around the center of itself, not around the center of its origin. Well, then you're gonna to have to try and make sure that you move the origin back or at least move the vase back to where the origin is. So now with the origin right in the center of my vase, that means it actually rotates neatly around the center. So same thing with this vase. It's gonna put this up on top of the table here. Tables and chairs are all, actually they're not where I want them to be. So I'm gonna put them on the Z axis and rotate them around. 180 degrees, grab them again, pull them back along the z-axis. No, not this, the z-axis, the y-axis, but actually I want them to be next to the window and the table. I mean, and the, the window and the portrait. So that way we can see the portrait and the window when we animate here. So x-axis, bring it up to the window here. Okay, now our person can walk through the door and walk up to the table. Let's zoom in on this with the period button. Okay, oops, I ended up selecting too much. Grab the table, bring it back towards the window again. Grab it along the Z axis so it's actually Beneath my vases, now pull my vases up in the bowl. Grab that up along the Z axis. There we go. Push the table, push the chairs into the table. And actually, this second chair is going to be the one that our person's going to sit in. So let me grab this, pull it back along the X axis, rotate it along the Z by 90 degrees. No by 270 degrees. There we go. Grab it again, push it into the wall. Leave it slightly pulled out from the table so that way our person can actually come up and sit down in it. Grab it again, pull it back along the y-axis a little bit further away from the wall. Okay. And that's pretty good. All right, so we are getting about to the halfway point. Again, my name is Doug Tepe. I'm the lead instructor for Tinker and Create, and this is the class on 3D modeling and animation. I'm just going to quickly go back and check to see if there's any questions here. No questions. All right. If you do have any questions, feel free to submit them. I will try and check them again one more time before we're finished here. Um, let's see here. Okay. It says that it hasn't received a video signal, but we're actually live right now. Oh, I see. That was before we actually started. Okay. 
All right, so it looks like this is all working well. If you have any questions, feel free to submit them. Otherwise, I'm gonna go back into this again. Take a look here. All right, so um, hid all my objects by accident. There we are, now they're back again. Let's press the zero to take a look at the scene through the camera. Camera's pretty well positioned. Now that I've actually put in the, the window and the portrait and the picture. Let's lock the camera to the 3D view, grab it here. All right, no, I didn't mean to grab the chair. I wanted to grab the view, move this around. There we go. So we're actually centered around the chair right now, which is great because that's actually the center point for everything. Actually, no, let's not do that. Let's um, pan a little bit to the side over here and zoom in. All right, so the center of the pan point is actually kind of in the middle of the floor there. And what I think we're gonna do is actually, we're gonna use two cameras. I'm not sure we're gonna get around to both cameras today, but we'll start with this camera. And we'll actually animate the camera itself too, and have the camera just turn slightly here as the person walks across the room. Or maybe pan across the room a little bit. Maybe the camera will do something like this as the person walks across. Yeah, that's what we'll do. So this is a good starting point for the camera. Now let me click off lock camera to view. Great, now we just gotta bring our person in. So we're gonna grab the person. Whoa! <laughs> I need to grab the armature, not the person. That was a little crazy. Okay, so now with the armature grabbed, I'm gonna move him along the Y axis and then grab him one more time, move him along the X axis till he's over by the door. Let's zoom in. Let's turn on the material preview by pressing the Z button. I wanna see which way he's facing. Rotate around the Z axis. 90 degrees. No, not 90 degrees. Try this again. Rotate along the z-axis. 270 degrees. Now he's facing the room. Cool. And he's even looking over at the chairs. That's great. Push him back to the door. And we're ready to animate. Okay, so let's see if we can cover the very basics of animation here. First things first, we're gonna look up here along the top to our different workspaces, and we're gonna switch over to the animation workspace. And I'm going to introduce you to what we see here in this particular workspace. So, same thing as when we were using the texture paint workspace, it gives us still a the standard viewport over here. So of course you can switch around in pose mode or object mode or whatever you please. Over here on this side shows what the camera sees, which of course is very handy because this is what's actually gonna be rendered once we actually start creating a video. And then down here on the bottom is the dope sheet, which I know is a very silly name, but actually it is the name that animators have been using for a long, long time to describe the piece of paper or the clipboard or whatever the case may be that has all the information about what's going on in your scene. It lists all of the animated objects. So let's start out by animating, um, let's just animate a simple sphere for now at least so we can get the basics of it. Let's click on add to add a mesh. Or hey, we could even add Suzanne the monkey. Suzanne the monkey is always a good person to practice with. She's kind of funny, fun to play with. All right, so first things first, once we have Suzanne the monkey added, we need to create a keyframe. So a keyframe is basically telling the animation that this is the main pose that we're gonna be starting with, the main position, rotation, um, all the extra details that we're gonna be starting with at a particular point along the dope sheet. So the timeline in the dope sheet right now is down at the one marker. If you're not on the one marker, you can use the um, jump forward or jump backwards buttons here to go all the way to the end or to the beginning. 
So we're gonna be on the one marker here, and we want to drop down a keyframe. So we press the I button to insert a keyframe, and it's gonna ask us what kind of a keyframe we want to add. So is it a keyframe that's describing its location, a keyframe that's describing its rotation, or its scaling, or its location and rotation, they call that the lock rot, or its location, rotation, and scale, the lock rot scale. And there's many, many, many others, but uh, usually the lock rot scale is good enough if you don't really know how you're animating it or you actually have a plan to animate it in several different ways, then um, you'll want to use a lock rot scale. So now we'd see over here, over on our dope sheet, we've added in, there's Suzanne the monkey, and a category called Suzanne a Action, and then a section called Object Transformations, and now we see it has all the different descriptions of how we might be animating her. So it's recorded her X location, her Y location, and her Z location, as well as her um, Euler rotation, the X Euler rotation, the Y Euler rotation, and the Z Euler rotation. So that funny looking word there is named after the guy who originally mathematically described how objects can be rotated. His name was Euler. E-U is an oi sound. I guess it's French. I don't know. Someone can correct me in the comments. So, uh, and then there's the three scales. So we have all of these keyframe notations marked in our dope sheet. So, now what we want to do is we want to animate her over the course of, say, 30 frames. So the standard that I believe Blender starts out at is at 30 frames per second. And we can find out what that is by going to the output properties here. So over on the right hand side of our screen, there's this picture of a printer. And it tells us what the output is going to be. If we're just taking a single picture, it'll show right up here what the resolution is, how big it is, and then how many frames it has. So 250 frames. And then the frame rate down here. So 224 frames per second. Um, so yeah, I could actually say that I can make my action occur over 24 frames, which means in one second, this thing will happen. And we can even change that. For example, um, there's even 30 frames per second, which is standard for a lot of computers or a lot of high-end video gaming. A lot of people will often do 60 frames per second. Um, even a lot of movies have been produced in 60 frames per second. Um, that's not usually necessary. And of course, it does mean that your computer is going to have to do that many more calculations just to make sure it renders that. Uh, and in case you're wondering what these weird ones are, 29.97 or 59.94, those actually happen to be the frequencies of old-fashioned cathode ray tube televisions, the kind of televisions that I grew up with back in the 1980s. They actually had an electron gun at the back of the TV that would shoot off electrons to the front of the screen. And it just so happened that the frequency that they were shooting off those electrons resulted in things being seen at roughly 29.97. So that's why they still have that there um, in this day and age when we've got flat screens and LCD screens and it's really not necessary anymore. We can be very precise. So anyways, I generally prefer 30. So I'm gonna to stick to 30. So we move this up to the 30 frame and now we do our change. So let's say I want to rotate Suzanne the monkey and I'll rotate her around 180 degrees. Now that I have her rotated to her new position, I'm going to put in a new keyframe, lock rot scale. So now we can actually see how she's animated. You can actually grab on to the frame slider here, and you'll see her as she animates around. So that's what the keyframes do. The keyframe will actually specify a starting position and an ending position as we go along. So of course I could, for example, if I wanted to be silly, I could go up to 60 frames, rotate Suzanne along the Z axis, 180 degrees again, drop in another lock rot scale, another lock rot scale, um, keyframe here and now she makes a complete 
180 degree turn. Now, a lot of the same buttons that we've used before can also work here as well. So as I've mentioned in previous classes, we can duplicate things by pressing Shift D and I can make an extra chair that way. The same thing works with whatever I'm animating. So I click on Suzanne, you'll see back in the dope sheet here, she's listed again. And I can click on each group of these, of these um, keyframes here, press Shift D and I can duplicate it. Now, one thing you're gonna notice is that when you first drag off your duplicated one, it creates this bar connecting it. That bar basically means that nothing has changed in that particular category. But as soon as I pass the other one, then there's a now a change and I go up to 90. So if I go from zero to 30 to 60 to 90, now she actually goes backwards at this point. So I can rotate her along that way, or I could even grab these first ones and press shift D, drop it down at the 90. And now she does the full 180 in between these two. And we can keep on rotating it around, make it look like she's shaking. Yes, no, yes, no, all around. Now, of course, as you might imagine, we have other possibilities that we can to do too. Since we're using lock rot scale, we can even grab her and drag her to a new location. Drop in the keyframe lock rot scale, and now you'll see that as she rotates around in these previous keyframes, in this new set of keyframes, she will animate up above. And I can even go up to 160 here. Scale her out. Drop in a lock rot scale. And now animating in between these, she now scales up to a larger size. Now, if you want to see the whole thing actually working, take it back to the first frame again and press the space bar or click on the play button down here and you can see your object animating. <laughs> and that's actually kind of silly. So yeah, animation's not too terribly difficult. Just keep track of your keyframes. When we crack open our object transformations here, you're gonna see that since we're using lock rot scale, it's still recording everything. But sometimes, for example, the rotation is not being recorded. So like in these keyframes here, the rotation is no longer being recorded, so it creates these big yellow bars going all the way across it. But now the scale is being recorded, so it shows how that is changing by removing the bars there. We can go back to these earlier keyframes and see all the extra details there as well. Just remember, of course, that if you want to make sure that you're making the changes as you go along, we just click right up here on the top where it says Suzanne Action, and you can select all of them at the same time. Otherwise, you might end up getting problems here. Let's say, for example, if you move your Z Euler rotation over here, then it might have unexpected results. So now that that Z rotation has been moved all the way up here, the keyframe doesn't actually start, and now it has to animate those very quickly between all of these. So then she does it really fast there. That's actually kind of cool. Hey, wait, let's just see if we can move some around again. So we can actually change the speed of how it's changing by pulling it back. And now she just did that one super quick. But then the later one gets slower and so on and so on. You can click and drag these things around however much you want. So by dragging that back now, her, the animation of her growing larger is slower now because it's taking longer to go. And we can even drag this all the way to the very end. And now it's just gonna use that many more frames to show the change at the end. So the dope sheet is very handy for making those sorts of changes. Uh, we're gonna say goodbye to Suzanne for now though. She has done her job of demonstrating for us. And now we're gonna click on our person here. Zoom in on the person. Same thing as what we did before. So we are going to switch it into pose mode. And with the pose mode, we can actually start making the changes that we want. Now I generally recommend pressing the A button to select the entire body when you're making changes or when you're placing in 
um, when you are placing in your um, when you are placing in your keyframes. Yes, that's what I meant to say. So I'm going to use a lock rot in this case. We're not going to scale at all, but we might end up rotating. But as you can see, it lists every single bone here. Now we are using all of these because as we're going to be going along, we're going to actually start adding in more animations as it goes along. But first things first, at least, we want to make sure that we move the entire body over to its new location. So let's see here. I am going to look straight down with the top orthographic view. The reason I'm doing this is because I don't want it to sink into the floor as we move it along, but I am going to be moving them along slightly rotated, uh, excuse me, slightly diagonally. So first things first. Oh no, looking down at my keyframes, I see that I placed my keyframes on the 36th frame. That's no good. So let's just drag them back to the zero again, to the first keyframe, I mean, here we are, to the first frame, I'm sorry, the first frame is where our keyframes are sitting, that's where they are, we're going to drag that back, so that's where we're starting with, let's go to the next location, how long would it take for our person to walk across the room, I don't know, two seconds or so, so I'm going to pick a halfway point between the chair and the person, Drag it up to the 30, grab them, and bring them over towards the middle point here. Rotate them slightly because they are starting to walk towards it. Drop in my lock rot there. Now I'm going to grab it again, drag it over to the chair. So they're just in front of the chair, rotate them back again because they're going to be wanting to kind of go straight into the side. Maybe a little bit closer to the chair like that. Make sure we're up at, f oh, ha, see, I should have brought it up to frame 60 ahead of time. So of course, you're going to notice that if you don't drop in your keyframes or you start making these changes, then as soon as you move your timeline slider here, it's going to snap back to where the previous keyframe told it to be. So I just lost my progress. That's okay. Let's move up to frame 60 here. And um, now I can actually push it over. Rotate him back so that way he'll be able to sit down. And he's going to sit down by kind of pushing himself back a little bit. So put him right next to it. We're not going to worry about the legs quite yet. We'll animate those later at least. But now that we have them close enough, we'll drop in another keyframe, another lock rot keyframe. There we go. So walks towards it, then straightens themselves out again. You can see that the actual rotation is actually turning towards it briefly as they walk forward, but then to the side as they go over to sit down. How long does it take for a person to sit down? Probably another second so we're just going up to the 90 now go up to the 90 grab the person push them inside the chair here roughly where they would be sitting and i'm also looking over here on this side where the camera shows it so i can get an idea of whether or not the person's positioned enough next to the chair. Good enough. Again, the legs are going to be moved out of the way as we do the animation of sitting down. But for now, they are hovered properly over the chair or the sitting down at this point. So we can drop in another lock rot. There we go. So now they animate across the room. Go and sit down. And we've recorded the positions of all the different bones at the same time, too. So that means that as we go up to a new position here, I can actually change the pose as we go along. 
just by picking each individual bone. All right, so going back to my main pose mode here, I'm gonna to wanna to take a look to see how they move as they go along. So the back leg is gonna be the one that's pushing off from the ground. So it's the front leg that's going to be reaching forward to step in the new location. So every four frames, maybe? Now, of course, that's not divisible by 30, so that's going to make it more complicated. So I'll just do every three frames. All right, so with the third frame here, actually just going to select the entire legs here, drop in a new keyframe, location rotation. Go up to frame six. Now I'm gonna grab this leg. Oops, here we are. This leg, pull it back. Straighten out that leg. Pull this leg forward and bend this back a little. And you know what? I was kind of twisting them apart because I was looking at it from the diagonal side. So let me undo all that here again. Actually, the best way to undo when you're on an animation is just to go back to the previous keyframe. All right, so I'm gonna be rotating it along the x-axis here. No, the y-axis, there we are. So that way the legs are just going straight forward and backwards. Nothing weird like side to side. That would be kind of funny if we were doing some kind of funny dance, but we're not. So instead I want to lock it into the Y axis so that way they're going forwards and backwards properly. And then Straighten this one out along the y-axis. Okay, now grab this leg. Y-axis again, this leg's reaching forward now. And this one bends a little. Again, locking into the y-axis, there we go. Okay, now we grab the legs again. Drop in a keyframe, lock rot. There we go. Probably actually animating them too close together. So let's see here. I can actually just click and drag this over. And maybe drag this one over to that. Yeah, okay, maybe that'll work. I'll just do them every five frames. Uh, and then the same thing again. So we want to bring the legs back again. I can duplicate this just by dragging it up to the 10 point. And then click this one and duplicate it up to the next point. So the legs are animating. Probably too much knee bending there, but close enough. And mind you, when I'm duplicating these, again, just keep in mind what's inside the actual arm attraction. I'm only actually changing the bones. So of course, you do have to be careful that you don't accidentally go off and select the entire body because the entire body now is actually moving along on the previous path that I gave it. But still, I have the animation of the legs going along here at the same time. Like he's doing kind of a hop, trot, hop, trot the whole time. So duplicate, shift D to duplicate. There we are, up there again. And we made it to our first set up here. We'll probably need to actually copy these ones over. We can actually just hover them straight over this and it'll override what it was before. There we go. So again, I'm only changing the legs. 
Be careful that you don't select the entire body, otherwise you might end up breaking the rest of your animation. And so yes, we can actually just keep on duplicating it at this point. Or of course, I might even want to go in and change how the uh, legs were as I was noticing. I might actually just need to get rid of all these extra duplicated um, keyframes here, because maybe I wasn't really satisfied with the initial animation of the legs bending and the like. But we can also just go back here again to frame one. And of course, as people are walking, they are swinging their arms. So as you notice, as I click on the arms, left and right, then when I'm looking down here at the dope sheet, it's just showing a solid bar all the way through, indicating to us that the arm never changes the entire time. So of course, we're gonna to wanna to animate the arm as well. So keeping in mind how people walk, the opposite arm always walks with the opposite leg. So right now, since this leg is going back a little bit, I'm gonna pull the arm back a little bit. Remember, I have to drop in a new keyframe. This time it's just for the arm alone. Location rotation. But then as the other leg goes forward, then we're gonna rotate the arm forward. Drop in a lock rot. And as the leg goes back again, locking it into the y-axis, the arm goes back. Again, this is the right arm that is going along with the left leg. Drop in a keyframe here, lock rot. And then at this point, we can probably even start duplicating them. So Shift D, and I can, whoops, duplicating the entire set. No, I just want to be duplicating this one. Here we are. And duplicate that over here. And duplicate these ones here so they're running opposite. And so now the arm goes back and forth properly. And we'll also want to do that with the left arm. So taking it back to the beginning here again. Left arm here. Rotate it along the y-axis till it's... Actually, this one was in the right position all along anyways, because the left... The right leg was already sticking out. So the left arm was also sticking out. And then we'll go up to the next keyframe where the leg goes back. Rotate it along the y axis till it's back. Drop in a keyframe, lock rot. And it made up to the next one. Rotate it forward. Drop another lock rot. And now we can probably start duplicating it again. Oh, but not everything. Let's click on the one set here. There we go. So again, it's only showing the information on the dope sheet for the one particular object that I'm moving here, This, in this case being bone002L. And so it has new information for its rotation. There we go, and they're walking back and forth. And I'm probably gonna to wanna to touch this up a little bit more, but looking at the time, we are practically out of time. It is 7.59, but I did forget to check to see if there were any questions. So let me just go back quickly and see if there's any questions. No questions, okay, great. So if you guys do have any questions in the meantime, this was the class on digital, uh, 3D modeling, I should say, and animation. So uh, next week, we'll just be animating this a little bit more. I'm probably gonna spend a little bit more time in the meantime, just polishing us up a little bit so we can actually have more fun next week, uh, actually adding in sound effects and we'll be adding in some music. And I'll show you how you can actually then uh, render your uh, 3D animation so that way you can put it up on YouTube and show the whole world whatever silly story 
or serious story you might actually want to share with people. So again, this was the Tinker and Create class on 3D animation and 3D modeling. I hope you guys had fun tonight and we will see you again next week for class five where we're going to discuss adding in music and we're going to polish it up and um, add in some sound and other fun. So hope you guys had fun and I will see you all next week.